Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our latest Retina UK webinar, which tonight focuses, focuses on bright futures empowering young adults with inherited sight loss. My name is James Clark, and I'm the Events and Community Fundraising Manager here at Retina UK, and I also live with inherited sight loss following my own diagnosis of retinitis pigmentosa nine years ago. We're really looking forward to tonight's webinar as we'll be speaking to two amazing members of our community and we'll introduce them shortly. Yes, good evening everyone. My name is Aisha Ahmed and I'm 22 years old and I'm a research intern at Retina UK. Similar to James, I also live with inherited sight loss. I've been living with road, road, road cone dystrophy since the age of six. Tonight's webinar will be recorded and it will be available on both YouTube and Spotify later this week if you'd like to listen to it again. If you've missed one of our previous webinars or podcasts, do visit our channels and website to catch up on those. And if you'd like to submit a question during tonight's live session, then please use the Q&A chat function on Zoom and we'll pick those up throughout the live webinar. Tonight, we're excited and honoured to be in conversation with two young people who have turned their challenges into triumphs, and we're really lucky enough to be able to hear them share their stories with us this evening. Our two guest speakers this evening are Carolina Packernight, an, an inspiring adventurer and PhD student aiming to be the first deafblind person to climb Mount Everest, and Ryan Taylor, a determined young man with rod cone dystrophy who overcomes challenges and excels in his career and personal life. So first up tonight is Carolina. She is an incredible 28 year old who is aiming to become the first deaf blind person to climb Mount Everest in April 2026. Carolina has Usher syndrome and as part of her training for her rather epic Everest challenge, she recently took on the National Three Peaks Challenge and managed to scale the highest peaks in Scotland, England and Wales in just under 24 hours, which is obviously absolutely incredible. So firstly, thank you for joining us, Carolina. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's our pleasure. Thank you. So firstly, just tell us all about you and introduce yourself and kind of just tell us your story so far with Usher Syndrome. Yep. Uh, so, um, my name is Carolina, also known as Caroline. Um, I was born hard of hearing, but uh, and I had a perfect sight for uh, a long time. I was always complimented by my uh, perfect sight, but then I started to get clumsy at the uh, late late teens, in the late teens, and I went to get new glasses because they started to get wonky. I wasn't expecting anything new, but I failed my field test, and that's when I got prepared to see a specialist at the hospital, and uh, eventually I got diagnosed with a system from uh, yeah, um, this, this was uh, uh, about nine years ago, uh, I, I got matched with my guide dog, <coughs> uh, Buzzley. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, amazing. So, as I mentioned, you are aiming to become the first ever deafblind person to climb Mount Everest in a couple of years' time. Why did you decide to take on Everest? Because obviously it's pretty big and pretty kind of iconic. Not many people can say they've done it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so last May, I went to Everest Space Camp. Uh, it, it was always my bucket list. I was always wondering about what it's like to be at the top of the Everest mountain. But... Uh, Everest Space Camp seemed huge, so I just went for it. I had the opportunity. Um, uh, going to the top was always a fantasy. It was never a reality. You know, it's too expensive, too dangerous. But 
Well, I was tracking, I met some Anthony as well on the way. And I started to whisper to myself, what if? <laughs> and I also met uh, some deaf pounders who were trying to become deaf, deaf people, the summit terrorists. And that made me realize actually has no deaf blind people went up. <laughs> um, so at that moment, I had the huge urge of wanting to claim the spot. <laughs> so I came back to UK. I uh, emailed different brands out of curiosity if, if I, anyone would support them. I did get some good responses and I thought if, if I can get some support already, I think it can happen. So I just went for it. And yeah, it's been a year now since the base camp and a lot has progressed and yeah, I'm going for it. Nice. <laughs> uh, um, uh, my journey is being documented in my is filmed into a documentary and uh, hopefully it'll be filmed into a documentary and the purpose behind it is to raise awareness about uh, deaf blindness or blindness, how you know it's not black and white. Uh, there's lots of stereotypes and misconceptions about blindness, so I want to change that by showing my journey of climbing Everest. Yes. <laughs> oh, amazing. And if people are interested in following your journey, do you have social media or websites that people can follow? Yeah. Uh, uh, I am most active on Deaf Project. It's, it's Instagram on Instagram, the username is Deaf Blind Everest Project. Um, it's the same, same user, username for other channels, so YouTube, TikTok, also website www.deafblindeverestproject.com. Amazing. I'm sure there'll be lots of people listening that are wanting to follow your journey. So I'm sure people will be checking that out. So yeah, we'll come on to the National Three Peaks in a minute, but if that wasn't enough, and I'm exhausted even just reading it, you also took on the London Marathon in April of this year. How did you find taking on such an iconic race? <laughs> uh, it was amazing. The atmosphere had a lot, a lot of fun. Uh, I went with my sighted guide. Uh, so it's also part of my Everest training to test my endurance and... My sighted guide is from Nepal, so uh, he's also interested the summit terrorist, maybe, maybe not, but he's been supporting me on this journey, so we've been training together, and yeah, we did the London Marathon. It was quite hard, because there were lots of people. Uh, it was hard to nav navigate around them. Uh, uh, I wanted to go a little faster, but <laughs> uh, but on the, our GPS it said on our apps it says that we did forty three k instead of forty two, like one extra kilometer because we were <laughs> you know winning a lot of people. <laughs> God, as if it's not hard enough, you did extra. <laughs> <laughs> There is amazing. Not many people can say they've achieved that. So you're achieving so many incredible things. Um, so yeah, tell us about the National Three Peaks. How was that? Uh, yeah, it was incredible as well. Um, uh, I went with my so uh, with the gym members. They they joined me and also with my team. The Nepalese sighted guide and my coach. So it was a nice group of us. And yeah, we wanted to do it in 24 hours. 
I was just part of training for editors, uh, test of endurance and being able to do it uh, during day and night. And yeah, the three different peaks had its own challenge for me. Uh, first one was Benavis, which is highest. Uh, um, it was not that hard. It, it's, I, I, it wasn't hard. I don't think we all really enjoyed it, but we somehow ended up taking one hour extra there. So for the other two peaks, we had to really, really rush. <laughs> and then for the second peak, it was during night time. So it was that session run. Uh, which is basically RP, the little night is big there. So I, I have night blindness, so I can't see well. And the terrain is really, really uneven, really hard. But after training with my sighted guide for almost a year, I, I really got to know how, how he. Uh, is able to run like I can I can feel him so I somehow managed to run without being able to see which I, I really got surprised at myself. <laughs> uh, I also had my other side of the item on the other side, so I had two people holding two people to hold to hold on to. Mm -hmm. uh, then the third peak. Uh, Snowden, which uh, for me, for me, it was uh, scariest for me because I had a big incident about 10 years ago where uh, 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 it, it was uh, we started the day, but then it started raining. And then at the top, it was snowing, it was windy, our waterproof got soaked, we got lost, and we were, we were losing daylight. So <laughs> when we landed at the snow, then uh, I was nervous, but and, and it was foggy, but in about half an hour, we broke through the clouds, and the view was uh, magical, and then... Uh, I knew everything would be okay, but we, we were one hour behind, so we had to run. We had to run, and so reached the top. And then last 40 minutes, we ran down, <laughs> and we managed to do it with three minutes to spare. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's incredible. So... Just one thing I really wanted to ask you, actually, was just around, so what would you say to someone listening who is living with inherited sight loss themselves and they're so tempted to take on something like you've been talking about, so the Three Peaks, London Marathon or anything, even if it's just a standard race, a smaller race than that, like a 10K, what advice would you give to someone? Uh, um, one is to find a sighted guy that you, you can trust and enjoy each other's company and then second is one thing that I learned from London Marathon is not to train in the empty path actually make most of busy busy path if you ask. like you need to learn how to navigate different so like in races there's lots of people so yeah <laughs> definitely and I think one thing to mention that most people when I speak to them don't realize is that if it's an organized event like the London Marathon they do actually help with finding you a sighted guide so if anyone's ever interested in getting involved in an event just get in touch and we can help you arrange a sighted guide because we'd hate for someone to miss out on an amazing opportunity so there are ways around it yeah. um so what else do you have planned for your training as you approach Mount Everest in April 2026? There's about a year and a half to go, isn't there? Yeah. So um, 
Uh, so I have a set of milestones, so I'm halfway now. So yeah, the three piece London marathon, a half marathon, and a winter skill squads in Scotland was the first half of my journey. Now it's getting a lot bigger. Uh, uh, so next one is to do a Concagua in Argentina uh, to, to test to start. Building up my attitude, attitude, uh, and then yeah, I have a set of milestones. After that, I'll be trying to attempt my first ultra marathon. <laughs> ultra marathon. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> uh, and then keep building up my mountains. So I'll be get. I will try. To do Denali after that, and then Manasalu in Nepal, and then Everest. So slowly build it up. Yeah. <laughs> God, it's incredible. So, and one thing that's really amazing as well. So your epic challenge was actually covered on BBC News as well, which obviously you said at the start, raising awareness is something that's so important, isn't it? So have you received lots of good feedback from the coverage? Uh, yeah. Um... Uh, lots of exciting people want to follow my journey, which is really encouraging. Yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Carolina. I am exhausted just thinking about one of those things, never mind all of them combined. Um, so just as a reminder to everyone, if you've got any questions that you'd like to submit for either Carolina or Ryan, who's about to join us, then please submit the questions during the Q&A um, during the Q&A with the chat box on your screen. And I'm now going to hand over to Aisha, who's going to have a chat with Ryan. Thank you, Carolina. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Carolina. Honestly, you're just so inspiring. Okay, so now I'm delighted to say that we are now joined by Ryan, who is going to be sharing his story so far of living with rod cone dystrophy. So hi, Ryan. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hi there. Uh, how are you? you? You doing okay today? Yeah, I'm doing really good. How are you? Uh, I'm great, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on tonight. No, honestly, thank you for being here. So, Ryan, I was wondering if you could tell us about you and your story of so of your story so far with the Rodcon dystrophy. Um, well, it probably starts when I was younger, and um, first of all, my mum had noticed when I was watching the TV that I wasn't looking directly at the TV. I was just kind of looking to the side or I would shut one eye. Uh, it's usually my left and my right eye that I would shut. And uh, so my, my mum took me to the, the opticians and then they referred me down to the hospital. But my granddad on my dad's side and his two sisters, they've all got inherited sight loss from uh, it's RP they've got, but it's rod cone dystrophy that I've got. It, so it's missed, it missed my dad out, it missed my big brother out, and now I've got it. So... Um, I've just the way I've grew up. I've just tried to stay determined. Really, I've uh, I've I've never turned my nose up at anything. I've always I'm, I'm always willing to go out and do stuff, and I'm not I'm not one for saying no, really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, live, you know, I live with the same condition as well, and you know, being diagnosed with it is a huge thing. So, how did it impact you? Um, I, I thought when I was growing up. It, I was only partially sighted. It's only been recently that I've been diagnosed as like registered blind. Um, but when I was partially sighted, it, I think a lot of the time I try and use it as a as a motivation to because I know that I'm out there showing people that nothing should hold you back. Really, like why why if I go out there and I just don't I don't do anything and I don't let I I I, I show people that I'm not doing what I. What I should be doing and what everyone else is doing, then it's not a good look. I don't think. I think I should be going, inspiring people, going out, leave leaving the house every day, going out. I do like Muay Thai and Jiu Jitsu and stuff like that. So I do it like MMA. Oh wow! It's, so I try and I try and use it as more more like a positive rather than a negative. 
it's a motivation rather than like holding me back, I would say. Yeah, and I think that is something that a lot of people can really kind of take away is not to use it as a weakness, but use it as a strength, just yeah, like you have. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So after a not so pleasant experience at university, you left higher education and embarked on a food and drink operations of modern apprenticeship. What made you choose this and how was your experience with that? Um, to be honest with you, it was first of all when I got the job, it was just like a lo- local meat factory. Uh, so I worked there for two years before I started my modern apprenticeship. Um, so I was getting full time work plus I was also getting qualified as well. To be honest with you, it was just because how local it was and how easy it was to get the transport to it. But then once I started uh, in the job, I kind of I came on leaps and bounds really, and I started. I, I was a I ran like my, my own machine, my, my own team of people. So um, with the modern apprenticeship, uh, as I said earlier, uh, one of the guys, uh, the managers asked me if I wanted to, to take part and I don't turn my nose up at anything. So uh, an extra qualification and uh, it, it was really enjoyable as well. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's great how you turned a negative experience into a positive and, you know, you were actually nominated for apprentice of the year how was that that must that's an amazing achievement oh so. yeah it was great it really was it was a scottish modern apprentice you know the, the scottish apprenticeship awards i was in one of the categories so there probably would have been thousands nominated and i was like down to the final three uh i had to go up to aberdeen to like an award ceremony and stuff uh got like a dinner and things like that it was the feeling it, it's like pride but it's also realizing that people pardon the pun, but people are seeing seeing the, the progress that you're making and seeing the hard work that you're putting in and they're understanding that the hard work that I put in it's a lot it's a lot more than what a sighted person has to put in. Like I, I work that extra bit harder all the time. It's well not just me, but you know what I mean. Yeah, definitely. I think people sighted people sometimes take for granted a lot of things that yeah. people like us find harder. And I think you being nominated, I think it just made people recognize, you know, how hard yeah. you've had to work to get to where you are. A, a, a lot. Uh, some of the people that I was working with, they were kind of saying, "Oh, it's the simp- You've you've only been nominated because it's the sympathy card and stuff like that." But for me, it, it's not the it's not the sympathy card. It's that I'm actually been noticed what I've actually done. And how different it is from a sighted person from doing it. A thousand percent, yeah. So, from your experiences so far, what advice would you give to some give to someone in a similar position to where you once were? Um, don't let anything hold you back. I, again, and I, 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 I know I keep saying the same thing, but I think it's a massive thing. You need to go out and do it. You need to get out and you need to do stuff. You can't you can't just sit in the house and no and no want to do anything and and can you roll over to it? Because as soon as you roll over to it, you're never gonna look, you're never gonna win in life. That so you're 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 kind of writing yourself to a life of misery. Where you whereas if you get up and you, you get up in the morning, you go and do your thing and you go out and you're in, and you're enthusiastic and you're motivated. I think it, it goes a long way and it does get noticed as well. People notice that you're doing it. Yeah, I think that's really, really powerful. And, you know, I know myself how difficult it can be living with a progressive sight loss condition, such as broad cone dystrophy. So how do you keep so motivated and driven? Um, as I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. It's, it, it's not like I wake up every day and I'm a positive, positive thoughts all the time I've I think as as we all have we'll all have had our ups and downs mornings that you don't want to get out of your bed and stuff like that but it's the point about what you're going to get out of life if you don't I don't want to waste my life away Uh, especially the last I was registered blind from from I think it's just I've I've actually left my I was in because I know I'm a lot more I I've took that leap to then go and try. I'm trying to get into like disability sports or like body massage or even advocacy. I'm getting in contact with a few people about becoming an advocate or maybe trying to get into the youth parliament or something. Oh, wow, that sounds incredible. And, you know, just on speaking to you, you know, I just get the sense that, you know, you've taken ownership of this, you know, disability and, you know, you're not letting it hold you back. And 
I think it's so powerful and you know I really get the sense that you're just so resilient and have so much strength with everything that you've achieved and everything that you want to accomplish I think um I, I, that is one of the biggest can you the most frequent compliments I do get is people I always say I've, I've, I've always got a smile on my face I'm always trying to be happy I'm always trying to get every, everyone involved and in everything I'm very resilient I don't let my, anything hold me back so I think the, these kind of traits that you don't you don't just not ha naturally have it you need to consciously try and put that those thoughts into your, your head that I can do this I can do this you know, rather than just accepting it that you can't because if as I says before if you accept that you can't do it then you're never going to be able to do it a thousand percent and I think it's really important for young people especially these days to hear that so I'm really glad you said it so my last question is what are your plans for the future um well as I've just touched on it with uh, my career wise but uh, hopefully next year uh, maybe about May time I'll be fighting in a MMA fight or a jiu-jitsu tournament or like a it's a no no striking like wrestling and jiu-jitsu match. So it's like only leg kicks and like no no head no head kind of strikes. So oh. hopefully next year. But um, I was meant to be doing it in November, but I'm not going to have enough time to get the the fight camp in when I'm looking for other other work and different stuff like that. And can I ask, how did you get into that? Was that something you were always interested in? Um, well, no. I I actually I used to play football up until I was the age of about maybe fifteen. Uh, I, the last season of football I played, I was Players Player of the Year, and then it was the next. Se it was halfway through the next season. I could feel my eyes deteriorating that bit more. Mm -hmm. So, and I, w I went one of the days. I kind of went up to head of the ball, and uh, just the way the sun was caught me, I just completely lost track of everything. And I thought, no, that's I'm no, I'm no putting myself through this every week because that that's when it starts to really get you down. When you don't try and adapt, you you just try and keep doing the same thing that's not working. It's, it's all about adapting but with the MMA so I've always been a sporty person so because I've, I've always played fat bat and I'm not able to now well I'm not able to play like sighted football anyway um, I thought MMA like jiu-jitsu so you can do jiu-jitsu with your eyes shut because it's mm -hmm. all about grappling it's all about feeling stuff like that and I'd seen a guy it was actually a guy on TikTok it was uh, called the blind grappler and he's like a world champion and I just thought I think I think I'd be quite good at that <laughs> Oh, wow. I mean, thank you so much for sharing your story with us, Ryan. It's honestly so inspiring to hear. And I wish you the best with everything. Well, thank you very much for having me on as well. Thank you very much to both of you. I agree with Aisha. Very inspiring. And I'm sure everyone listening will agree. So we're just going to ask you some questions now from our audience. If anyone else has got any, please do feel free to keep sending them in. Um, the first question, and I'll ask this to both of you, I'll start with you, Ryan, actually. Do you find that speaking about your conditions and your journeys helps you to process it? Um, I think we, it, it depends on who you're speaking to, because you know when you're speaking to somebody that they're not understanding any, I think it's, it's kind of pointless to try and well, no, no pointless because you could then educate them. But what I mean is when you just know they're no interested, it's not that they're no understanding, it's they're no interested, it's it's pointless because that's just going to make you feel worse. But if you're speaking to, like, say, a, the, the peer support groups at Renton in the UK have got people that understand, it's it's so helpful. Even even me being on here tonight, just listening to Caroline, it's it's helped me a lot as well. Amazing. And what about, you, what about you, Carolina? The same question. So do you find that speaking about your condition and your journey so far helps you to process it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, uh, so I've, I've been interviewed about it to share uh, about Russia syndrome and it's it's been some ups and downs. I thought, you know, after nine years, I, I um, I'm completely fine, but it's, there's still some down days and then other days, up days. So, but uh, sharing it on social media feels quite empowering. Like, um, you can see how people are starting to understand about it more, and uh, yeah. <laughs> 
Amazing. And we've actually got a question for Aisha. <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, so obviously you're on an internship with Retina UK at the moment. So what are your plans for the future afterwards? So I'm going after my internship, which I think ends in October. Yeah, it ends in October. I will be going back into education. I will be undertaking a master's in clinical mental health sciences because I want to become a psychologist. Amazing. You'll definitely smash that and know it. And how did you begin working for Retina UK, Aisha? It was through Thomas Pocklinton, Pocklinton Trust, wasn't it? Yeah, so I think my mom actually sent me a link about Thomas Pocklington and they had this program called the Get Set Pro Progress Scheme, which is basically for all visually impaired people, no matter where you are in the UK, and they basically help you get an internship. So basically help you get into work. And it's been so amazing working at Retina UK, but also the support of Thomas Pocklington. I think it's such a great scheme and I would highly recommend it for anyone that's wanting to kind of get some experience or, you know, has been into work and, you know, wants to go back. It's, yeah, been really great. Oh, we love working with you. We don't want you to leave. but I know, I don't want to leave either. <laughs> we um, know you'll keep in touch for sure. Um, just going back to our panellists then. So there's another question for you, Ryan. Um, and it says, can you share an instance where you turned a significant challenge into a triumph? And what did you learn from that experience? So it's basically going back to turning a negative into a positive. Um, well, for example, well, going back to my last answer about the MMA and the football, that was a massive thing for me because, like, giving up the sighted football, it was because that was like my life, really. I used to play football all the time, like every day. And I think when it changed, when, when I realised that I had to stop it, it was a massive blow mentally. But then it took took me a, a few years, but I've turned that now into a triumph, uh, doing MMA and stuff. And I'm also going to be looking into getting getting into some blind football as well. So I think just it's it's finding an adapt, adaptation to what you're, already, what you're already interested in. If, you, if you're not able to date anymore, it's just, it's, taking a step back and thinking how can I then change this from a negative to a positive as I was saying definitely is that the same for you Carolina uh, uh, sorry from the question yeah so it's um can you share an instance where you turned a significant yeah. challenge into a triumph and what did you learn from it yeah. um yeah 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 uh to be fair, I think all of your challenges, you've turned your <laughs> diagnosis into an amazing positive, really. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So, and it feels like you're only just getting started. There's lots more to come, I'm sure. Um, okay, let's just move to another question then. I'll stick with you, Carolina. So has peer support played a role in your journey? So speaking to others kind of a similar age? So, so. I'll just say it again. So did you, have you spoken to other people kind of a similar age to you? And has that peer support helped play a role in your journey? Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, 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 I have. When, when I got my diagnosis, I started different groups, charity groups, like different uh, peer support and uh, yeah, my, my best friend, she also has a syndrome and having, having a friend who, who experiences similar uh, challenges really, really helps, I think, yeah, for me, yeah, I would, I would encourage to uh, get that done and keep meeting people and Amazing. And focusing kind of on young people is something we're working on a lot at Retina UK. So how about you, Ryan? Did you speak to kind of friends and people similar age to you? Um, I think for for the peer support way, like people with inherited sight loss, I've I've not actually met anyone at my that's anywhere near my age. Um, but I, I'm I'm getting involved in the peer support support groups for Retina UK because I think um it's going to be very beneficial for me to 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 be doing that, as I've no had any really support like people that truly understand. I've been I've got a really good family and friends network round about me. I've got 
a lot of people in my life that, that are very close and they give me that emotional support. But it, it's not the, the emotional support's not the same because they don't really understand the hardships and they, they can try and understand, but they'll never understand really. But I've got uh, my great aunt, Jean. Um, she uh, she gives me a lot of support. She's helped me throughout my life. Like um, she she's quite she's an older woman now though. Uh, I so that she's the the only like any um, inherited sight loss support I've had so far anyway. But I'm getting involved in the the Retina UK peer support groups. Amazing. Yeah, we'll talk about those in a minute. Actually, just because it's always good to just signpost people to remind them. Um, just another quick question for Carolina. So it says, how does Carolina keep positive during the long distance challenges? Because I'm sure there's some <laughs> tough moments throughout. Um, uh, uh, so I have my team, so I have to have your company that, that you enjoy. And then uh, I do lots of training. It's something I enjoy, I enjoy, and then I keep thinking about my bigger challenge, which is Everest, so uh, I think that keeps me motivated, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. And then, Ryan, what do you think about this question? So it says, what are some misconceptions about living with inherited sight loss that you think people should know about? Oh, um. I, th I think um a, a lot of people ask me anyway is it must be it must be rubbish it must be so hard it must like you must be sad all the time and I think that that misconception itself is really I think it's people need to be educated more on you could disabilities don't make you unhappy if if that makes sense it's like my with my say um as I said in the kind of first answer it was it's using it as a positive you know the misconception of people saying that. We we're not as happy, like we won't be as happy because you can't see. It. It's not the case. You 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 build up the other parts of your life to then compensate for that the happiness that you're maybe listening through seeing. You can you can maybe see it, start listening to music, really nice music that you love. Come kind of rely on your other senses, kind of thing. Definitely. Did you have any misconceptions, Carolina, that you found throughout your journey? Um. I had I had the lot, so that's why I am trying to to document my journey, uh, to break those stereotypes and remove the misconceptions. So, uh, for example, a lot of people think I am training my guide dog, or uh, uh, maybe they. Uh, they don't, they're not trying to be rude, but they, I get some comments saying, oh, uh, you, ha you don't look blind, you, you look, you have beautiful eyes, but, um, uh, um, they, they get confused while I'm looking at my phone, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so through the journey, I'm trying to so what challenges have faced yeah <laughs> Definitely. can i just um add to that yeah. one again please um when i was in i was over in germany last week for like uh, two weeks ago for the euros and actually i, I asked a scot because i was with the tartan army because i'm scottish uh, i asked a, another scottish guy whether he could help me to my seat and he told me and um, i'm not going to say the word but it was he can he swore at me told me to, where to go kind of thing and um, so that misconception, he thought that I was trying to get a beer quicker because he was in the queue for the beer, but I didn't realise. And he thought I was wanting him to get me a beer so it was quicker. So he thought I was lying about my eyesight. And I was, I just can't close. I was in a part of the stadium myself. My brother and his, and his girlfriend, they were in another part of the stadium. So I was really needing someone to give me help to get, get, get to my seat. But one of the local Germans, they got me to my seat, uh, explained the full game, to me like who had the ball where the ball was in the park and then got me two beers at half time so I didn't have to go down and get them or try and find my seat again so that misconception from it, like because I don't wear glasses as well I think me
So I think that way to be having glove it didn't do it. I don't know what now. Yeah. Yeah, it's obviously sad to hear that. And we do hear similar things quite a lot. But I think, like you say, it is misconceptions. And it's a big kind of education piece, just educating people on invisible disabilities. And I think we've definitely still mm -hmm. got a long way to go. Um, Just touching on that, um, funnily enough, this is the final question. It's how do you find travelling with sight loss? So you both, obviously, you've just been away, Ryan and Carolina. You've got a big epic trick coming up. So how do you find travelling? We'll start with you, Ryan. Um, I think it, it's quite well, it's, it, it has its perks really because in the airports you get to skip all the queues. <laughs> you know <what> I mean? <laughs> so I think there is perks to it, but I think most of all, in, unless you've got someone with you, like a family member or a friend or someone that you're traveling with, it's really, really difficult. I don't, I don't think I would be able to, to navigate through an airport myself. So I think you need companionship when you're going I think when you're travelling especially abroad not as much when you're on, only on the trains and the bus seasons like local but I think when you're going up it's, it's de definitely useful unless you can get in contact with someone from the airport Definitely and what about you Carolina? Uh, yes um, I think it requires you to constantly plan it out you can't just spontaneously uh, do it. Like you can, but yeah. Like if you want to have a smooth journey, you have, you're you're constantly finding yourself planning it out, and uh, uh, I'm quite independent. I'm I make most of support when I need it. So. Exam. If if um, I'm, I'm, I I travel quite a lot, so I know quite lots of routes, so I, I I can do it independently. But if I'm say go to London, my guide dog is not trained to go and escalate so I make most of uh, assistant and a train and and trains, yeah. I, just, I always find it fun, funny how they, how I hear them talk on a walkie-talkie. Oh, there's a VIP. Uh, she needs help. <laughs> it feels so special, but I know they mean visually impaired person. <laughs> uh, and then my guy that is not trained on planes, so I make most of assisting. Uh, in airports, because uh, sometimes if I don't take that support, um, uh, I find myself sometimes I I encounter people questioning like, oh, why do you have a cane? Uh, like, so I I, I, I I like to have. Uh, company with me, yeah. Amazing. Well, thank you both very much for answering those questions, and thank you to everyone that submitted them. Um, so as I just mentioned, actually, supporting young people with inherited sight loss is a big part of what we do at Retina UK. And I wanted to actually tell you all about an exciting new virtual event that we are hosting next Tuesday. So on July the 16th, we are hosting our first ever Young Adults Online Summer Social where young people with sight loss can come together to share their stories, find out more about each other's experiences, and also join employed in let me start again, and also join various breakout rooms that are going to be themed on different topics. And those topics include finding employment, supporting others with sight loss, buying your first home or renting for the first time, and also talking about your various hobbies and interests. So it's going to be a really fantastic event. And it's a real good opportunity to meet others with sight loss and create connections and friendships. So if you are interested in signing up to the Young Adults Online Summer Social, please visit the Retina UK website or just give us a call or send us an email and we'll send you the registration link. We have seen the importance of connecting with others with sight loss and 
our peer support groups that take place around the country, both in person and online, are hugely important. If you'd like to find out more about our peer support groups, you can search for peer support groups on the Retina UK website at www.retinauk.org.uk. And all that's left for us to say is a huge thank you from Aisha and I to everyone who's joined us live this evening. And the biggest thank you, of course, goes to our two incredible and inspirational guest speakers, both Carolina and Ryan. Thank you for sharing your stories and for sparing some time to join us this evening. And if anyone wants Thank you very much for having Sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you for sharing your stories. And if anyone watching or listening would like to find out more about the work of Retina UK or sign up to future webinars, and please visit our website. Or don't forget to follow Retina UK across Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok, and LinkedIn. Thank you for joining us, and we hope you have a lovely evening.